Today's topics are the field vectors and Maxwell's equations. And these are primarily review material, material that you learned in your undergraduate physics and engineering courses. So we begin with the idea of electric charge. And these days, the fundamental unit of electric charge, the Coulomb, is defined by defining the elementary charge which is the charge on a single proton, or the negative of the charge on a single electron, E, to be exactly 1.602 and some more digits, the exact values given in the PDF notes, times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And with that definition, of course, we can say that when coulomb is the charge on one over that number, right, which is going to be a, a big number on the order of uh, almost 10 to the 19th, that number of protons. Yeah, it turns out to be about uh, 6.242 times 10 to the 18th protons, or minus one coulomb would be the charge on that number of electrons. And so that's how we define now the coulomb. And there's historical reasons for the definition of the, of the coulomb. And so this uh, definition is adopted to, uh, to keep us pretty close to that historical definition. Now, we define an electric field by the force it exerts on a charge. So if we have a charge and we have a charge Q and we see that it is, uh, has a force F exerted on it, then we know there must be an electric field E present. We could turn that around and say the electric field is the force per charge. Well, force is measured in Newtons and charge we said is measured in Coulombs. So the units of the electric field are Newtons per Coulomb. Now, we can put that into different terms. Let me write it this way, newtons per coulomb. We could multiply by meters, top and bottom. And then newton meters, that's a joule. So that's joule per coulomb meter. And then we define a joule per coulomb, we'll come back to this, to be a volt. So that would be a volt per meter. And so that's the, the units we most often associate with the electric field, volts per meter. But we could use newtons per coulomb also. And that's more related directly to the fact that electric fields exert forces on charges. Now Coulomb, after whom the Coulomb is named, conducted the classic experiments that showed that the force between two charges, the magnitude of it, is the product of the charges over a constant, which we write as 4 pi epsilon 0, times the square of the distance between them. So that if we have two positive charges, Q1 and Q2, that force will be a force of repulsion. And it'll be equal and opposite, the same force uh, of repulsion, although oppositely directed there. If we have negative charges, then we have negative numbers here. Well, if they're both negative, you would still have, the product would be positive, we'd still have a force of repulsion. But if one is positive and one is negative, then we get a force of attraction, then it's a negative repulsion. And that's called Coulomb's Law. Now, why do we have that constant there, and why do we write it as four pi epsilon zero? More, more on that a little later. But it's because of the way we define charge and distance and force. 
we could have defined charge so that the force is just the product of the charges over the square of the distance. But that would lead to a different definition of charge. And the way we define charge in this international system of units is such that we need to have this constant in here. And we put the 4 pi in there for geometrical convenience. Now let's think about what the units of this constant epsilon zero are. We can figure that out just from the units here. This is charge squared. This is meters squared, and this is force, newtons. And so we can see that epsilon zero has units of, well, let's put the epsilon zero up here and put the F down in the denominator. So you'd have Coulomb squared over newtons meters squared. Now I'm gonna write that as Coulomb squared over a newton meter is a joule, so that's a joule meter in the denominator. And then we said that a joule per coulomb is a volt, so this is one over a joule per coulomb. So this would be equal to coulombs per volt meter. And then we define the farad, which is the unit of capacitance by one farad, one F, is equal to one coulomb per volt. Remember, a capacitor is a device where when you apply a voltage to it, a charge flows onto that device. And the amount of charge per voltage is measured in capacitance, in farads. So epsilon zero has units, and let's actually write out the, this numerical value also, which is to four digits, eight, 0.854 and then some more digits times 10 to the minus 12th farads per meter. So this becomes farads per meter. So that's called the permittivity of free space. And what we can say then is, given that the force between two charges has this relationship, that by symmetry, if I have a charge here, Q1, and I'm out here at a distance R, that because the force on the charge Q2 is Q2 times whatever electric field it's subjected to, I must have that this electric field, which I'll call E1, must be everything else that's in this expression. So that would be Q1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. And then if I put a charge right here that is Q2, well, the force on that will be just Q2 times the electric field E1 due to charge 1. And this would be directed in the direction of the line that joins the two charges. So A, we'll call that AR hat. Now it's convenient, we'll see why later, to define a new field vector that we'll call, um, so let me just rewrite this without referring to a specific charge and let's just say, for a general charge, E will be equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared times A r hat. Let's define a vector D that in free space is epsilon 0 times E. And we just get rid of that constant epsilon 0. And so that would now be Q over 4 pi r squared A r hat. So E has units of volts per meter. What does D have for units? Well, here it's coulombs per square meter. So it has units of coulombs per square meter, coulombs per area. And this E we call the electric field. 
and D we call the electric flux density. In free space, they're just proportional to each other, and they have different units, and those units turn out to be more convenient for different types of calculations. Now, magnetic forces are most apparent when we have wires carrying current. So suppose we have the dot here means that current is flowing out of the board. We have a current, say, I1 here, and over here a current I2. In that case, what's found experimentally is that these two wires attract each other. And if you turn one of the currents around, then they repulse each other. And by looking at how this behavior uh, varies with the distance, uh, let's call it rho, between the wires and the symmetry of it and so on, we can determine two things. That the wire here in, let's say this is the xy plane, and that is then carrying current in the z direction. So current I along the AZ hat direction. That current creates a magnetic field. This is the angle phi, and this is a distance rho from the origin. Then this here is a magnetic field vector H, which is the current I over 2 pi rho times a phi hat, where that's the unit vector in the direction of increasing phi. So it circles around the wire in a right-hand sense. The, put your thumb along the direction of the current, and your right fingers go in the direction of the magnetic field. So over here, for example, um, uh, current I1 would create a magnetic field here at the position of I2, which would be here H1. And then there is a force on a current in a magnetic field that looks like this. F is equal to Q V cross mu zero H. Mu zero again is a constant that's put in there to make sure that we get the right force for the given velocity and charge and magnetic field. We could have defined our magnetic fields and forces and charges, etc., so that this mu zero was not there, just as we had in the electric field case. Um, but we don't do that. We use different criteria to define our, our basic units. Okay, so it's just some constant. In fact, we'll define a vector b to be equal to mu zero h, and we'll call h the magnetic field. And we'll call B the magnetic flux density. So kind of mirror imaging what we had with the electric field. So the force will be charge times the cross product, other than this constant mu zero, cross product of V and the magnetic field. So the charge uh, velocity here would be coming out of the page. And so the cross product of that and this magnetic field would be in a direction towards the other wire. And likewise over here, well, let me move this label here. So if we use this uh, right-handed orientation, current I2 would produce a magnetic field over here, H2, that would point downward. And then we would have the Z uh, component of the velocity coming out of the board across this H2 would be pointing back towards the other wire. So the wires would attract each other. Let's see what the units of the magnetic field are. Well, up from this expression up here, they would be, this would be amps of current, and this is meters. So H has units of amps per meter. So just as the electric field has units of volts per meter, H has units of amps per meter. Let's figure out, uh, right, because if we re rewrite this here as Q V cross B with this definition of this magnetic flux 
a vector, then we can figure out the units of B because this would be newtons of force. This is coulombs of charge and this is meters per second. So therefore, we can see that B must have units of newtons per coulomb dividing by the Q and then dividing by the velocity, meters per second would become seconds per meter. And so that must be the units of B. Newton seconds per coulomb meter. Let's multiply top and bottom by meters, Newton meter seconds per coulomb meter squared. And let's see, a Newton meter is a joule. So that would be joule seconds over coulomb meters squared. And remember that a, a joule per coulomb is a volt. So that would be joule per coulomb would be a volt. So we'd have volt seconds per meters squared. And now we're going to define a new unit, the Weber, such that one Weber, WB, is one volt second. And then B has units of, well, what would it be working backwards? This would be a Weber per square meter as units of Weber's per square meter. Now remember that uh, E had units of volts per meter and D had units of coulombs per square meter. And if you look at the analogy kind of here, um, it turns out that B looks like some amount of something per square meter, just like D was some amount of, of electric charge per square meter. If there was a such a thing as magnetic charge, it would have units of Weber's. Now there is no such thing as magnetic charge. That doesn't keep us from having a magnetic flux density that's defined in terms of that. We'll see why as we go along. Um, so now we have electric and magnetic forces and we can put these together into the total force on a charge, which is F is equal to Q, E, there's the electric force, and then plus V cross B, there's the magnetic force. So this is the entire electromagnetic force on a charge. And that expression there is called the Lorentz force. That's the Lorentz force equation. In practice, this tells you how electric and magnetic fields actually are manifested. They are manifested as forces on charges, either uh, stationary charges or charges in motion. Those are the physically observable effects of electric and magnetic fields. And we could take them, therefore, as the definition of the electric and magnetic fields. How do you know if you have an electric field? How could you make an electric field meter? You put a charge somewhere at rest and you see if it's a force is exerted on it. If it is, then the force per charge is the electric field. Uh, how do you know if there's a magnetic field? Well, you shoot a uh, charge at some velocity. That should be a vector velocity there. Uh, and then you look at the resulting force and you figure out the magnetic field, uh, well, the magnetic flux vector um, that produces that force given this equation. Right? So that is how you could determine and measure and quantify electric and magnetic fields. Now, it might be a little unsettling that we have for the electric field, we've got an electric field E and we've got an electric flux density D, which in free space is epsilon zero E. And for the magnetic case, we've got a magnetic field H and a magnetic flux density B, which is mu zero H. But really, as we, we talked a little bit about this uh, previously, but um, 
these constants, epsilon zero and mu zero, really come from the way that we define our basic units. We could have defined units so that, so we could have defined things so that D is just equal to E and B is just equal to H. And these are just the same vector uh, in both cases. But that would require us to have different definitions of charge and force and things. And so in the international system of units, we have definitions that then require us to have these constants. Now, that's okay because when we start to talk about materials, even if we had make, made this definition, so we defined our constants and our, our, our units basically so that we have this, this uh, relationship, it would still be in materials necessary, as we'll see, to have a constant of proportionality. So this really wouldn't be as, uh, as clean as, as it might look. Once we start to talk about materials, we still have to have two vectors for each of the fields, both a field vector and a flux density vector. Now we come to Maxwell's equations. And as a preliminary, uh, let's note that we've talked about the definition of electric charge. And now let's define charge density as little q is d charge d volume. So if I have a little element of volume here, dv, then the charge dq in that is the charge density q times the volume. And of course, then this must have units of coulombs per cubic meter. So it has units of cou coulombs per cubic meter. And we'll also define a current density J, such that if we're at some point in space, and here's the current density, this is a vector now, and we look at a little element of surface area here, directed surface ds, so ds is parallel to the surface normal, and the magnitude of ds is the area of that little patch, then the current that flows through that will be di, will be j dot ds and so j will have units of well this is amps and this is square meters so it'll be amps per square meter so with that we're ready to look at maxwell's equations we start off with goss's laws there are two of them they're based on the divergence theorem, which is also sometimes called Gauss's theorem. The first one is for the electric field. It says that the divergence of the electric flux density is equal to the charge density. And using the divergence theorem, we can write that as the integral over a closed surface S of the flux d dot ds through that surface is equal to, and the divergence theorem says this would be equal to the integral over the volume of the divergence of d, d volume, but the divergence of d is equal to q. So we get this relationship. And of course, what is this? This is just the total charge inside that volume. We will call q enclosed. And if we call this thing here, the electric flux, psi sub e, we have that the electric flux through a closed surface is equal to the total net charge enclosed within that surface, in the volume bounded by that surface. Let's 
So what does that tell you? If I have some uh, charges inside some surface, I'm going to have a net outward flux. If they're positive charges, if they were negative charges, I would have a net inward flux. And this tells you that charges are sources or sinks, depending on whether they are positive or negative, of the electric field. So that's Gauss's law for the electric field. For the magnetic field, Gauss's law reads that the divergence of B of the magnetic flux is equal to zero. And the integral form would then be that the integral over any surface, any closed surface, of B dot TS is equal to zero. You could take this as a statement that there is no magnetic charge. If there was a magnetic charge, then you would have a, a charge density over here on the right, and this would be equal to the enclosed magnetic charge. And it would have units of Weber's, as we've already talked about. But you don't get that. So this tells you that uh, if we call this guy here, the magnetic flux, psi sub m, that's equal to, always equal to zero. So there are no, no sources or sinks of the magnetic field, unlike the electric field. Now we come to Faraday's law. Now, Gauss's laws just are, they, we have separate laws for the electric and the magnetic field. Faraday's law is an example where we, now we have an equation that relates these two. And Faraday's law in differential form says that the curl of E is equal to minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux density. The integral form of this would be the integral around a closed loop of E dot DL is equal to minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux, B dot DS, through that surface. Um, this expression here is sometimes called the electromotive force. It would be a voltage. Remember, E has units of volts per meter, and then the DL would be meters. So this would be the number of volts that you would gain in going around that loop one time. And this would be equal to minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux through any surface that is bounded by that loop. So that is Faraday's law. Notice that you have to have a time-varying magnetic flux to get this, this effect. So if you're in a static field, you do not have this effect where a time-varying magnetic flux is generating this voltage, generating this electric field. And then we have a similar uh, equation that kind of goes the other way. And this is Ampere's law. And it says that the curl of the magnetic field, curl of H, is equal to, well, on a slight difference, there's a term J, which is the electric current density, plus the time derivative of the electric flux. So if we didn't have this current density here, there would be kind of a symmetry between these two, although one has a minus sign. Um, and presumably, if there was such a thing as magnetic charge and magnetic current, there would be a magnetic current term up here in Faraday's law, okay? but we don't have that symmetry in nature. The integral form is that the integral around a closed loop of h dot dl is equal to the integral over a surface bounded by that loop of j dot ds plus the time derivative of an integral over that surface of d dot ds. And what is this? Remember j dot ds, that's just a little 
bit of uh, current that's flowing through that surface, that di. So this would be the, the total current, we'll call it i enclosed. The current that flows through this loop is enclosed by it, plus this is the time derivative. This guy here is the electric flux. So that then now gets us our four Maxwell's equations. So let's recap. We've got Gauss's law for the electric field. Divergence of D is equal to charge density Q. Gauss's law for the magnetic field. The divergence of B is equal to zero. Faraday's law, the curl of E is minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux density B. And Ampere's law, the curl of H is equal to the current density J plus the time derivative of the electric flux density D. And in free space, D is equal to epsilon zero E and B is equal to mu zero H. Now, any variables that we can get rid of in this, because th think about this for a minute, right? These, these are equations in four vectors, each of which is a function of the three uh, dimensions of space and one of time, the fourth dimension of time. So that's a very complicated set of equations. If we have sinusoidal time dependence, which we often do because we're often interested in electromagnetic fields at a single frequency, or even if we're interested in more complicated time dependence, we can always build that up as an inverse Fourier transform, build it up as in terms of components uh, of, of different frequency components. So if we have sinusoidal time dependence, we can use the idea of phasers. And so let's think about that. Um, suppose we have the, the real field, I'll put a subscript R in here just to, to note that this is a real, electric field that is a, a vector function of real numbers has real components in space and time and it's a function of x y z in space and t in time but if the time dependence is sinusoidal then we can use the phasor trick and write this as the real part of a phasor which now is a function only of position and but now it is becomes a complex vector vector with complex components, times e to the j omega t. And so this is a complex, necessarily, phasor. And that gets rid of a problem of time dependence. So that's very much going to be worth it to us. So we'll do this with all of our field vectors. Now, our equations have some time derivatives and they have some space derivatives. The curls and divergences are space derivatives and here the time derivatives are explicitly stated. Our time dependence is through a factor e to the j omega t. The time derivative of e to the j omega t is, well, the chain rule brings down a factor at j omega and then you've got e to the j omega t. So in the time domain, a derivative becomes multiplication by j omega in the phasor domain. And this then leads us to our phasor form. Which is what we will use almost exclusively in this course. So, let's go back here. The only equations that are going to look different are the, are the two that have time derivatives in them. So the Gauss's laws will look the same, except now these D will be a phasor and Q will be a phasor. 
For the magnetic field, we have the divergence of B is equal to zero. Again, B will be a phasor. And now we come to the parts that uh, would have time derivatives in the time domain. So we'll start off with Faraday's law. Curl of E is minus the time derivative of B. Well, that becomes the curl of E is minus the time derivative. Time derivative in the phasor domain is multiplication by J omega, right? And so you're gonna just have minus J omega times B. And you've got Ampere's law that the curl of H is equal to J plus the time derivative of the electric flux density. So that'll be plus J omega D. If D is equal to epsilon E, not necessarily epsilon zero, so we allow for materials, um, and B is equal to mu H, then we can put these in the form, the following form. We're going to put them in terms of the E and the H vectors. We're going to just write these expressions for D and B. So we'll have the, the divergence of epsilon E is equal to Q. The divergence of mu H is equal to zero. The curl of E is minus J omega, and for B we put in mu H. And then the curl of H is J plus J omega, and for D we put in epsilon E. And so in that form, we don't uh, explicitly show two different types of vectors for each of the electric and magnetic field. We just showed that just the electric field and the magnetic field, and then we use these, this epsilon and mu parameter, and we'll talk more about that in a future lecture. Um, if mu and epsilon are constants, that is, they don't depend on position in space, well, then, when we're taking this divergence, right, which involves spatial derivatives, there are no derivatives of epsilon, so we can just factor that out. And then Gauss's law for the electric field becomes that the divergence of E is equal to Q over epsilon. And for the magnetic field, it becomes just that the divergence of H is equal to zero. Now, an interesting thing is if we go back here and look at Faraday's law, for example, notice we can solve that for H. Let's solve that for H. H is equal to multiply both sides by J. You get a J over here that J times minus J is one and divide by omega mu. So this would be equal to J over omega mu, the curl of E. And what does that tell you? If we know E we can calculate H. In other words, E and H are not independent. In fact, you can think of them as just two parts of the electromagnetic field, which is a single quantity in a sense. They're just two aspects of it instead of them being separate fields representing completely separate phenomena. They're two aspects of the same one electromagnetic field. And we'll make that even more uh, clear later on when we talk about something called vector potentials. But that's a big takeaway. It's the unification of electric and magnetic phenomena into a single electromagnetic set of equations. Here's another interesting thing. Let's look at Faraday's law. Curl of E 
is equal to minus j omega. And let's go back to the form where we explicitly put in the magnetic flux density like that. In our lecture and review of vector calculus, we saw that the divergence of the curl of any vector is equal to zero. But what does that tell us about the right-hand side of this equation? If the divergence of the left side is zero, then the divergence of the right is zero. And that would be then, on the right, we'd have minus j omega times the divergence of b is equal to zero. And omega is not zero. So what does that tell us? The divergence of b is equal to zero. We see that this form of Gauss's law, Gauss's law for the magnetic field, is actually contained within Faraday's law. We can derive it from Faraday's law. So if a field satisfies Faraday's law, then it will also satisfy Gauss's law for the magnetic field. Now let's take a look at Ampere's law. The curl of H is equal to J. Plus, and we're going to use the form that has the uh, electric flux density explicitly there rather than using the epsilon E form. So there's Ampere's law. Let's do the same thing for that. Now, we're not going to get that the divergence of D is equal to zero because we've got another term over here on the, on the left. But let's go ahead and take the divergence of the curl of H is equal to zero. And that's going to be the divergence of the current density plus J omega times the divergence of D. And from that, I can solve for the divergence of D, uh, let's see, move this guy over to the, uh, to the other side, multiply uh, by J and divide by omega, and you'd get J over omega divergence of J. Well, we know that Gauss's law for the electric field is that the divergence of D, we'll put a question mark here, is equal to the charge density Q. So let's think about this uh, a little bit. Um, say we've got a closed surface here, and it encloses a volume V. And inside that volume, we've got various charges, right? We've got our, our total enclosed charge Q enclosed. And there is a component of electric current through the surface. So that we can say that the current out through this surface would be the integral over that closed surface of j dot ds. But where does that current come from? Because charge is conserved, if current is carrying charge through that surface, that means there's less charge left behind. In fact, this I out must then be minus the time derivative of the enclosed charge, because this has units. What is, what is the unit of current amps, which are coulombs per second? So that must be here, the number of coulombs per second uh, by which the enclosed charge is reduced if you have current flowing out. Now, if, there's, if the current is flowing in, so this would be a negative current out, then this would be a negative negative. This would be an increase in the enclosed charge. But this is due to the continuity, or let's just say conservation of charge. But what is Q enclosed? Q enclosed is just the integral over that volume that's enclosed by that surface of the charge density D volume. And therefore, we can use this with the divergence theorem, right, to write that the integral over the surface of J dot ds, which is the integral 
over the bounded volume of the divergence of J dV. That's just an expression of the divergence theorem. But we've seen this is, this is the current I out, and that's minus the time derivative of this. So that's equal to minus the time derivative of the integral over the volume of Q enclosed, which is just the charge density Q dV. And that's got to be true for an arbitrary volume bounded by an arbitrary surface. So that can only be true in general if the integrands are equal. And that must mean that the divergence of J is equal to minus the time derivative of the charge density. Now, what does that tell you? I have a little volume here, dV. The charge in there is dQ equals charge density dV. And if there's a net divergence of J, that means there's a net outward flux through this uh, surface of this little cube. Well, then the charge density must decrease. D by dT of Q is minus the divergence of, of J. And in phasers, where a time derivative is replaced by multiplication by j omega, we have that the divergence of j equals minus j omega q, therefore. And that is called the equation of continuity. It represents the conservation of electric charge. So now let's go back up to this expression and plug that in for the divergence of, uh, of J up here. So we have up there, repeating what we derived previously, the divergence of D is J over omega divergence of J. That's J over omega, and the divergence of J is minus J omega Q. And the omegas cancel, and j times minus j is 1, and so that's just equal to q. In other words, this tells us that Ampere's law contains, in that sense, Gauss's law for the electric field. So from that, we realize that the, really the only two equations we have to solve are Faraday's law and Ampere's law. And the other two go along come along with, as part of the deal there. Let's talk a little more about current density. It is convenient, typically, to break up the current density into two components. J sub i, which will be, we'll call impressed, So for example, if we were driving a current through an antenna, that would be an impressed current. And then plus J sub C, which will be conduction. So like the kind of current you get through a resistor when you have an electric field. And if the material is linear, has linear electromagnetic properties, then we can write the conduction current density as a constant sigma times the electric field. This is the uh, differential form of Ohm's law, right? Which would say that, uh, that the current is equal to the conductance times the voltage. Here it's JC is equal to sigma times the electric field. With that, then Ampere's law becomes the curl of H is equal to J, but we'll break that up as J sub I plus 
J conduction, which is sigma E, plus, and we'll put J omega, and for D, we'll put epsilon E. And now we got two E terms there, so let's combine those. So we've got Ji, impressed current, plus, and I'm going to write it this way, J omega times, so here we have E times, uh, epsilon times E, sorry, epsilon times E, and how about the sigma? Well, I, I multiplied by J omega, so I've got to divide by J omega. I'll do that by writing it as minus J sigma over omega times E, a little bookkeeping trick there. J omega times this, the omegas cancel, J times minus J is one, that just gives you sigma E. But that has a form now of the curl of H is equal to impressed current plus J omega, and this is a complex number now, real minus imaginary, and I'll call that epsilon complex, epsilon sub C, times E, where epsilon sub C is the actual epsilon minus J sigma over omega. This is, um, sigma is called the conductivity. So if the material is conductive, we see that we can represent that in the phasor domain as if the permittivity is complex. It has a negative imaginary part. And more generally, we'll just write that as epsilon prime minus J epsilon double prime, the real minus J, the imaginary part of the permittivity. Now, the permittivity might be complex even if the material doesn't have any conductivity. It might be, this might be due to microscopic loss mechanisms within the, you know, the, the atoms and molecules that make up the material, we really can't tell the difference. All we know is that there is a complex component, effectively, of the permittivity. We could turn this around and just say, if we make this identification, if we measure that epsilon has an imaginary component, we could equate it to this form up here and say that it has an effective conductivity, which is omega times the epsilon double prime. Now, one of the things we know is when we have Ohm's law, the resistors dissipate energy. We get a dissipation, which is like V squared over R, for example. So let's think about that for a minute. Now, let's say, say we have a little volume here. And it's a little dV, and it has a charge dQ, which is Q times dV. And there's an electric field exerting a force on that charge. And the charge is moving with some velocity V. Um, I, I used U, sorry, so we don't confuse it with, with volume. U for the velocity. So, what can we say? Well, here's the thing. Um, force dot velocity is power. That is power, the rate of work being done by that force on whatever it's exerting the force on. Right? And that comes because right, the little bit of dW, a little bit of work, would be force dot dL. And then if you divide that by time, Well, that's just F dot velocity U. And dW dt would be equal to power. All right, so now in this, uh, this little, little box there, let's call this d power, dp, because it's a little differential piece of, of charge. Well, that would be equal to the electric field times the charge, Q dV, right? so that's the force, right? It's electric field times charge, dot U. But what is, uh, well, how is U related to current? 
Well, current density is just charge density times the velocity at which the current moves. Think about the units here. This is on the left, you right, you've got amps per square meter. And on the right, you've got, well, that's coulombs per cubic meter. And then velocity is meters per second. And one of the meters cancels, leaving you per square meters. And then a coulomb per second is an amp. So that works out in terms of the units. And so this becomes what? Well, let's, let's just take the, the Q and the U then together. That makes the J. So this becomes E dot J dV. So that tells us what? That the power density, the watts per cubic meter, dissipated by the electric field due to this driving this conduction current is E dot J. And now, if we're working in the phasor domain, E and J are phasors. Well, back in our lecture on vector calculus, we said that the time average of this dot product, if these are phasors, becomes, and we'll call this W, the power density, then W becomes, we had a formula, this is one half the real part of the first dot, the conjugate of the second. So that is a formula then that gives us the time average power per unit volume. Um, now, if J is sigma E, well then it simplifies even more because now this is just a factor of sigma and then E dot E conjugate is just the magnitude of E squared. So this becomes then just one half sigma magnitude of E squared. And just like the power that's dissipated in a resistor, this is never negative because of the E squared. So the electric field in a conductive material or a material with a, a what we'll call just a lossy material that has a complex uh, permittivity, there will always be uh, power lost from the electric field going into the material, which usually then is converted into heat. And that's how your microwave oven works. The electric field interacts with the conductivity of the, uh, of the water in the material that you're heating up and converts power per unit volume to it through this formula. Now let's go back to Faraday's law. The curl of E, and let's write it in this form, minus J omega mu H. And just as the permittivity can be complex, so too it's possible for the permeability to be complex. So that mu is equal to mu C is mu prime minus J mu double prime. And if that's so, then Faraday's law becomes the curl of E is minus J omega mu prime minus J mu double prime H. And let's see, so minus J times minus J is minus one, and then you've got omega mu double prime. So that would be minus omega mu double prime times h, and then minus j omega mu prime h. And furthermore, let's do this. Let's define omega mu double prime to be sigma m, a magnetic conductivity. All right, so we're here, we're 
sigma m is defined to be omega mu double prime. Well, this guy here, sigma mh, has the form of what we might think of as a magnetic current. Sigma m h. Magnetic current. And so then Faraday's law would be the curl of E is minus the magnetic current minus J omega U prime H. And we could drop the prime if we wanted to on that. And so what we've done is here is introduced a fictitious magnetic current because there aren't actually magnetic charges. But this is just basically modeling the lossy part of the right-hand side, which is due to the imaginary part of the permeability, as equivalent to a magnetic current flowing in a magnetic field with some magnetic conductivity. Now, the reason we might do this, um, right, we could leave everything up in this form here, right, just, just keep it as having a complex permeability, but put it in this form, then we can sometimes use this as a math trick to use some of the methods we use for finding solutions when we, when we have an electric current. We can apply it to this equation. All right, so again, it's, a, it's not saying that there physically is magnetic current. It's just saying there is a term in this right-hand side that when the permeability is complex, we can interpret as a fictitious magnetic current, and then that can let us use some of the tricks we have developed for getting solutions when we have electric currents. We'll talk more about that, that later on. So we have two equations we need to solve. We've got Faraday's law that says that the curl of E is equal to minus J omega B. E is the electric field, B is the magnetic flux density. And then we have Ampere's law. It says that the curl of H is equal to J plus J omega D. H is the magnetic field, J is the current density, and D is the electric flux density. So this is two, uh, composed of two vector equations in four vectors, E, B, H, and D, assuming we know J. And that's a lot to, to chew on, so to speak. So let's see if we, there's a possibility of deriving a single equation in a single unknown vector. Okay. And in doing this, we're going to assume that D is equal to epsilon E, not necessarily free space, or so not necessarily epsilon zero, and B is equal to mu H, and epsilon and mu are constants. Well, let's see, let's take uh, the first equation, and because over here, We've got a uh, curl of H, uh, and that's going to be obviously related. H is related to B. If we did a curl of this, we'd have a curl of B, which we could relate to a curl of H. So let's take the curl of this equation. So that's the curl of the curl of E is minus J omega, the curl of B. And now let's take Ampere's law, and to get this to read the curl of B, let's multiply through by mu. So then Ampere's law would become the curl of B, multiplying this by mu, and then on the right, we've got to multiply by mu. So that's equal to mu J plus J omega mu, and now D, let's write as epsilon E. So J omega mu epsilon E. 
Well, now this here, curl of B, we can plug in up here on this right side. So now we've got the curl of the curl of E, that's a nightmare, is minus J omega, and now plug in for curl of B over here. That's mu J plus J omega mu epsilon E. And that's equal to, see, minus J omega, uh, J omega, oops, minus J omega mu J. And then let's see, minus J times J is one, and then you've got omega squared mu epsilon. So plus omega squared mu epsilon times E. Now, we showed in our vector calculus lecture that the curl, the curl of E, um, is the gradient, oops, is the gradient of the divergence of E minus the Laplacian of E. Okay, and that's equal to minus J omega mu J plus omega squared mu epsilon E. So let's rewrite that, rearrange that, um, move the Laplacian over with this omega squared term. So we'll get Laplacian of E plus omega squared mu epsilon E is equal to, this guy will go to the other side, so it'll be plus J omega mu big J plus the gradient of the divergence of E. And now that's an equation simply in the electric field vector E with the source term, which is the electric current density J. Still kind of a nasty equation. Well, let's assume we have a source free region. So that would mean that J would be equal to zero and Q would be equal to zero. There are no charges. And remember that in a region where epsilon is a constant, divergence of E is equal to Q over epsilon. So Q is equal to zero, so that's gonna be zero. So this right-hand side is equal to zero. And now if we call this term there, beta squared, we have this equation. Laplacian of E plus beta squared E is equal to zero, and that is called the Helmholtz equation. And it is the primary equation that we're going to solve. It is a form of a wave equation. It is only, all right, this is for only for source free regions, which we'll deal with quite a bit. We'll have some cases where we have sources, but in a source-free region, we get this relatively simple equation. And remember that in rectangular coordinates, this breaks up as three scalar equations, one in each of the components. And, and so then you have another one for EY and EZ. So you get these three equations. And if, for example, you had a situation where you knew that there was only, say, an EZ component of the electric field, well, then you could so solve this single scalar equation. And then, using Faraday's law, from that you could figure out what H was and B and H by taking the curl of that. And you could reduce your whole problem down to solving one scalar equation. We're going to find that there's an even better way to do this in terms of things we'll call vector potentials. It'll give us some more degrees of freedom to allow us to solve more complicated problems where we don't have quite the same limitation. But 
this is the this Helmholtz equation is really the fundamental equation that for the most part we're going to be solving. We're not going to be solving it though for the electric or the magnetic fields, but usually for these things we'll call vector potentials.